We're in James chapter 1, and we're beginning at, at chapter, verse 13. But before we dive into uh, verse 13, I just want to give us a little a recap. In the beginning of James 1, James begins to talk about trials. And we spent a few weeks talking about trials and, and how they affect our lives and the value that there are in trials. And we saw that God has a purpose for our trials. It's not to bring us down, to make us fall, but God uses them to build us up. And we saw the value of trials in verses 3 and 4, where it said, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work. And so God is trying to work this patience, which is that word endurance. We talked about how it's like an athlete has to endure the work, and what we endure you know, when an athlete runs a mile, the more they endure, the easier that mile gets. And so the more that we endure trials, it's easier to not let it turn into temptations, which we're going to be talking about this week. And so it's to communicate that the Lord is working in our lives and he's working to mature us into mature believers. And so the purpose of trials is, again, to strengthen us, to make us mature and to grow in Christ and to have what we call perseverance. And we can't have perseverance or have a strong Christian life without adversities. As we talked about last week, we can't get it through a book. We can't get it through coming every week and listening to me. We can't get it through praying. It has to come through adversities, through trials, through, through tough times. And God brings those tough, tough times in our lives, those trials in our lives, so that we, we may be mature. God wants us to grow up. He doesn't want us to just remain baby Christians. He wants us to mature us. And so he brings these trials into our life. And so it says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing. And so now, while trials are sent by God as tools to build us up, to mature us as believers, temptations, we'll see today, are sent by the devil to bring us down and to make us stumble. And that's what James addresses in these, in these, chapter, in these verses that we're covering, 13 through 18. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to read through verses 13 through 18, and then we'll break it down. It says, let no one say when he is tempted. And so we see he's kind of switching gears here. He started talking about trials, and now he's talking about temptations. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God can't be tempted by evil. Nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by what? His own desires and enticed. Then when desires has conceived, it's given birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good, this, now this is an amazing thing that God, that he says here. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so again, first James begins the chapter talking about trials. And now he writes about temptation, being tempted. Now, why do you suppose that James is doing this? Why do you suppose he couples these two ideas, these trials and temptations together, when they're two entirely different things? The word temptation, by the way, in verse 13, means a solicitation to evil. It's something the devil does. It, it, God does not do that. That's what James is trying to make clear to us, that that's something the devil does. It's a tool that Satan uses to bring us down, to, to draw us away from God. It's a solicitation to evil. To, he knocks on the door and he solicits, solicits us. But why do you suppose, again, why, why do you suppose that James is coupling these things, trials and temptations? Well, I think it's because trials can turn into temptations if we allow them to. So it's how we deal with these things. And so last week we talked about how to handle trials. As a matter of fact, we talked about that in the last couple weeks. And trials are sort of from the outside, right? Trials come from, you know, things happen, situations happen, and it brings up upon a trial where temptations come from the inside. 
It's that trial that's there, but then our desire is to get out of it in any way we possibly can. And so we desire to sin to help us get out of that. And that's what the enemy does. He tempts us with these things. As it says in verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by what? His own desires. It's from the inside and enticed. So during a trial, during the molding process of God, God uh, he, we can tend to complain, right? We can tend to say, God, why, why are you bringing me? The to, why are you doing this to me? Why, why is this happening to me? And we can even say, God, is your fault. We can murmur against God. We can seek uh, to go away from God during trials and say, if this is the way you're going to treat me, God, then I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to do that. And because that's how our attitude is, Satan comes along and offers an escape from that trial right? He, you don't have to do what God wants you to do. You don't have to go through this trial. There's an easier way. And he offers an escape. And essentially, that's what temptation is. And so often, that trial can turn into, or we can turn it into, a temptation. An example in Scripture that we see of this is Abraham. You know, Abraham, he was called by God to the land of Canaan. We talked about this in the book of Genesis. We just finished Genesis. And so Abraham is called to the land of Canaan. And as he's down in the land of Canaan, he's led by God to be there. And he's going through this tremendous trial, right? The land wasn't good to supply for his livestock, his, his animals and, and his cattle and things like that. And so he's pressured in this trial and this famine comes. And God, what is he? He's mo- trying to mold him in, during this thing. And God has, is pressuring him a little bit. And he wants to prove himself to be f- true to, to Abraham. He wants uh, to Abraham could prove God in this and, and be faithful to God and desire to stick with God. But what does Abraham do? He goes to Egypt and he gets in all kinds of trouble in Egypt. And he essentially turns away from God. And, and what does God do? He has to chastise him by a pagan king, right? And so... He has to bring them back to Canaan where he can bless them again. He flakes out on God. But so Abraham took a trial and he turned it into a temptation. And we all have this tendency to do this. Even if Abraham can do it, and we all can have the tendency to do this. Because sometimes uh, these things are so closely related. And I think that's why James is coupling them here. Because right after he speaks about trials, he speaks about temptations. And so I think the overarching theme that we've had so far, and I've already said it today, is that God wants to grow us. He wants to mature us. In verse 4, that's what it says, that he wants to have us complete, mature, fully grown. But God uses trials to do it. God wants us to mature and be able to trust him. And so he uses these things. Now, in in the same light, God wants us to mature, but he can't do that by sheltering us from every temptation. You know, oftentimes they're like, God, please help me, you know, shelter me from this. But he can't do that if he, he shelters us from every little thing. God doesn't shelter his children. He wants us to endure through it. He wants us to grow through it. See, even the temptations from Satan, he, he can use for our glory, for his glory, to grow us and mature us. You know, an example of this would be Job in, in Scripture. I don't know if you're familiar with the book of Job, but uh, the, the Satan comes up and he says, you know, uh, Job, you know, I, let me have him. Let me, let me work him over. And God's kind of bragging on him a little bit. He's like, you know, look at my servant Job. He's perfect in all his ways, eh, Satan? And Satan's like, well, of course he is. You're blessing him. Of course he is. Let me have at him. And let me have at him. I'll, I'll, I'll work him over, and I'll work him over so much that he'll curse you to, his fa- to your face. And what does God do? God lets. God allows Satan to do this. He allows him to work Job over. But God knew the limits of Job, and he wasn't going to be, let him be tempted beyond what he can endure. And that's what Scripture tells us, that when we are tempted, the Lord gives us a way out. And we have to choose that way out. That's what we said uh, when we were talking about trials. And so God doesn't shelter us from temptations, but he does help us during, during them. He doesn't lead us to, to them. He, he doesn't tempt us, but he allows Satan to do, the, do those things. He allows Satan to tempt us. And even those things, God can grow us in. You know, for example, 
Uh, many of you know my story, but those of you who don't, I was a drug dealer and a drug addict before I really dedicated my life to Christ. And those was a dark time in my life. Those are, uh, I fell into temptation hard. And God was able to redeem that where now I can say, look what God did to my life. Look how I was this. I was a drug dealer. I labeled myself a drug dealer, a drug addict. And now I label myself as a believer and a, a son of God. And praise be the Lord that he turned that mess in my life and turned it into a message. He used that temptation that I fell into, and now he's using it for his glory. And that's what God does, even in the midst of our temptations and trials. And so, you know, we all know um, kids that were very sheltered when, when they were younger. You know, their, kid, their parents sheltered them, and... It seems like when when those type of kids grow up and they come into situations that are tough, they don't know what to do. And so God allows these trials and these temptations to mature us so we can gain that endurance that we talked about. So when when temptations uh, happen in our life, we're tempted to do something, we can say, no, I'm going to follow after God. I'm going to do that. He's endurance, building up, maturing us into believers. And so let's dive in a little bit deeper about what James is talking about in temptations here. In verse 13, he says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, or that God is the direct source. For God can't be tempted by evil, that is, solicited to do evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And so he's essentially saying we can't say it's God's fault. God led me to this temptation. God is tempting me big time. We can't say that. But here's the thing. It's in our human nature to do this. We don't want to assume responsibility for lots of different things in our life. And so we do this. You know, one example in Scripture is Adam in the garden, right? After they sin, God holds Adam responsible for his sin, for falling into temptation. And what does Adam say? What is his response to God? He said, Lord, it was the woman that you put here with me. (laughs) So he's essentially blaming God. Eve, but ultimately he's blaming God. It's the woman that you put me here, put here with me. So then God goes to Eve, and Eve, what do you say I have to say for your sin? And what does Eve do? It was a serpent. I'm gonna point the direction over here. It's the serpent's fault. He made me do it. And so it's our in our human nature to blame someone else for these things. And so James says, when you are tempted, you cannot blame God for your temptations. You can't say, I am tempted by God. And we'll talk about that a little bit uh, more a little bit later on, how we can't blame other people. But it's difficult for us to admit our guilt, to say it's my fault. It's hard to admit what we find in verses 14 and 15. It says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. And so James here is telling us where our sin comes from. Yes, it's from temptation, but it goes beyond that. It goes deeper than that. James tells us that our sin actually comes from our desires. And so I have this little diagram here. Sin is the the ultimate thing, that we, we sin, and our sin is because we are tempted, but we're tempted because of our desires. Now, if you think about this, you can't be tempted with something that you don't want to do. For example, if I were to give you, if I were to tempt you with a roach burger, that's pretty disgusting, right? I, you wouldn't want to eat that because it's not a desirable thing. But if I were to go to Authors, which I consider to be the best burgers on the island, there's a little promo for you. Uh, if, if I go to Authors and I, and I get this burger and I say, you know, let me tempt you with this des- delicious, yummy burger, then you're more likely to give in to that temptation because it's something desirable, And so you're not going to do something, you're not going to be tempted unless you desire to do that thing. And so that comes from within. And that's what James is talking about here. And so God doesn't tempt us. Instead, God comes, uh, temptation comes when we are drawn away by our own fleshly desires. The sin is giving in to our fleshly desire. And so the incorrect thinking is that sin is born from being tempted. Tempted. 
if we were sort of deconstruct sin like we're, like we're doing here and work backwards, we can see where sin begins. We can see that sin happens when we fall into temptation, but we're not tempted with anything that we desire. And so the question is, where do these desires come from? Well, ultimately, they, they come from the Lord. The Lord gives us these desires. And what happens is our desires come from the Lord, but the problem is that we, we try to fulfill those desires in a worldly way, in a sinful way. Let me just give you a personal experience of mine. You know, sex is an intimate desire uh, that is meant to be uh, enjoyed in marriage. It's how God uh, helps us to understand his love for us, that we are fully seen and fully loved. But outside of marriage, when Caitlin and I were having sex outside of marriage, it brought a, a lot of guilt and a lot of shame and a lot of worry. It caused a lot of problems in our life. And that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 7.10 says. It says, because of sexual immorality, now, now this is Paul, and he's speaking, of, he's speaking, he's answering a question like, should men get married? And this is what he, does. he says. He says, because of sexual immorality, in other words, because of this sinful desire that we have, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. And see, sexual drive is strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain it. That is what God designed it to be. That's our desire is meant to be fulfilled within marriage. And let me just give, give you a, in a different way. I say that uh, I have this garden, right? And St. Kitts is supposed to have the most rich soil, fertile soil in the world is, is what they tell me here. And so let's say I have this, this garden with this amazing dirt. It's full of nutrients, very fertile, and it's growing. It can grow pretty much anything. It's an amazing dirt, right? And say I have this dirt and I put it into a bucket. And then I take that bucket and I go to my mom's house where she has carpet everywhere and I dump that dirt in the carpet. Well, now all of a sudden, this dirt, where it was, it was a wonderful thing. It, it did what it was supposed to, but now it's causing all these problems because it's not where it's supposed to be. And so that's what sin does. That's what these desires do. When they're used in a, in a worldly way, they cause problems in our life. And we often believe that sin, these sinful desires that we have, must come from some remnant of our past, some dark corner of our heart or for some unseen attack from Satan, but these sinful desires actually come from something far more simpler. It comes from our sense of lacking. And that's what I said here. Our desires come from our lacking. We don't desire to do something unless we feel we lack whatever it is we're desiring. We, we feel like we're lacking uh, pleasure or acceptance or validation or power or whatever it may be, and we run to sin to provide for that, to provide a solution. Allow me to read 1 John 2, 15 through 17, and we'll see three desires listed here. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life come not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And so we see these three desires that are listed here, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the pride. That is what the body wants, what the eyes want to see, and what the soul wants to feel. And so why are these things there? Well, it's first the lust of the flesh. We feel like our, our body is missing something. It's lacking a current state of comfort or pleasure or satisfaction. So what do we do? We try to satisfy our bodies with drugs or alcohol or whatever it may be so that our bodies feel good. We run to these sinful things. And it's the same with the lust of the eyes. Ecclesiastes 1.8 says, The eye never has enough of seeing. And so we see something in the eyes and we feel like we need that in our life. You know, people that struggle with pornography constantly feel this lacking. What they watched last night isn't enough to stimulate them the next night. They always need to see more and more and more. And then there's the pride of life. There's something always uh, more. There's more worth that we can have. There's more power that we can have over someone. And so we feel this lack, and you want to fill that lack, this desire. You want to fill that gap. And so the solution is we must believe that God can satisfy us that he can satisfy those desires in us. Because every sin is rooted in unbelief. 
See, sin happens when we are tempted, but we're not tempted with anything that we don't desire. And the desire comes when we feel like we're lacking something in our life. And this unbelief comes from we don't believe that God can satisfy us. And you might say that every sin is rooted in unbelief. And you might say that, you know, that sounds crazy because even when I sin, I believe in God. But that's not what I mean. I mean, when we sin, we're making a public declaration in our hearts that our hearts believe something other than God can satisfy our desires, our deepest feeling of lacking and our desire. But Isaiah 58, 11 says this. It says, and the Lord will guide you continually and what? Satisfy your desire. In scorched places to make your bones strong, and you shall be like the watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. See, this is what God wants to do for you. This is what God wants to do for me. It's a wonderful thing. He wants to fulfill our desires. And so he wants to satisfy your desires and put, as you put your trust in him, believing he has something far greater for you than anything that this world has to offer. The desires, the, the way the world wants to fulfill your desires. And this is why last week that we emphasized the love for God. That love for God is our motivation. Our desire to please him has to be greater than our desire to sin, to be able to resist temptation. And so we need to see that belief is the root of holiness. Our love for him gives us a, a new desire, a desire to live for him and to be more like him. I think this is what Paul is referring to when he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. The old is gone and new is here. Because in Christ, our desire to live for him should be greater than our desire our fleshly desires to please a self, to please ourself, or else we will give in to temptation. And so we must desire after him. And he says in verse 16, he says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. This is easy to do. It's easy to be deceived. It's easy to blame other people when we fall into temptation. Because oftentimes, again, we don't want to accept responsibility for our actions. And as we said, we want to shift the blame on someone else, like we saw Adam doing in the garden. We'll say it's, it's God's fault. It's the devil's fault. And that's what James here is warning us against. And so we have to honestly accept responsibility for our actions. And it's not an easy thing to do because our, our flesh doesn't want to do that. We don't want to accept responsibility, like we said. But God created us with the ability to do just that, to see ourselves for who we really are. Because you could say it's someone else's fault or whatever, but deep down inside in your heart, we know there's something that wrong that I did. There's something that I need to make right. Proverbs 20, verse 27 says, The Lord give us mind and conscience. We can't hide from ourselves. And it's true. I don't know how many times I tried to push down these feelings that I've had. And then when I lay my, my head at night, all these thoughts, this shame and guilt comes to me because I know deep down inside I did something wrong. And so we need to accept responsibility. When we fall into temptation, we can't blame God. We can't blame others. We have to accept responsibility for our sin. And that begins with three things. Number one is be radically honest. See, the truth of the matter is that we ourselves are our greatest barrier to healing that comes when we accept responsibility. Our healing starts when we're radically honest and say, you know what? It's my fault. I, I did something. I'm the problem. We can't keep saying, if I, if I just change my relationship, if I just change my job, if I just change the locations, then everything will be fine. Because here's the problem. Wherever you go, there you are. So it has to change with the inside. You have to put yourself and say, okay, what do I need to change? The second thing is we don't rationalize. We have to be honest with ourselves and we don't rationalize. We need to be honest to face the truth about ourselves. And here's the thing. God is big enough to forgive us. He covers those things. Whatever the truth may be in your life, God covers it. Well, Jesus went to the cross so that we can have forgiveness for those things. 
And so we don't need to minimize our actions by saying it's no big deal, right? James says, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth what? Death. And that is a big deal. That's a huge deal. So we don't need to rationalize. And what we're really doing when we rationalize, we're doing essentially that. We're giving ourselves a rational lie to tell ourselves that whatever it is we're doing is okay, right? We're telling with our mouth and our head what our heart knows is wrong. And so we have to not rationalize about our situation, not make up excuses. And the last thing is exactly what James has already said. Don't blame others. James says, let no one say I'm tempted by God. We can't blame God for our, our sinful actions. So it's time to stand tall and take responsibility for our part in our life's problems. You know, I'll share an example in, in my, my own life. Um, my wife and I were, again, we, I talked about how we're, we're active, we're sexually active before marriage, and that carried over into our marriage, right? And for me, I, I tried to rationalize. I wanted to blame Caitlin. You know, I said, you know, now that we're married, everything's fine. I rationalized it away. Everything's fine. No big deal. We're married now. It shouldn't matter. And it wasn't until I was able to admit my my part in, in the hurt and the pain and the things that were going on, that God was able to heal our relationship. And so it's really important that we do. We are radically honest with ourselves. We don't rationalize and we don't try to blame because that draws us away from people, other people, and draws us away from God. But when we can admit those things, we don't rationalize and we don't blame, and we say, you know what, it is my fault. Let, let's work on this. Then, be, then that begins that, that mending that relationship. And it's such an important thing. And I've experienced that in my life. And I'm so thankful that I've been able to do that in my marriage because it's helped my marriage. You see, when we blame God and other people instead of accepting responsibility, you be lame. You be lame. When you blame other people, you're being lame. And so we don't need to be lame by blaming God and blaming other people. 1 John 1.8 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And one of Satan's greatest strategies in temptation is to convince us that the pursuit of our corrupt desires will somehow uh, produce life and, and, and goodness in us. Right? And, and we've all heard the saying that sin is fun for a season, but then it's not. And that's the thing with sin. So if we realize that, if we realize that Satan's only here to steal, kill, and destroy us, then it's easy for, it'll be easier for us to effectively resist the deceptions of these temptations. And if we really want to stop defeating ourselves, we have to do what James talks about in verse 16. We need to stop deceiving ourselves. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And so then James gives us a very important truth in verse 17. He says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Praise God for that. And then he talks about our salvation. He says, On his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits for his creation. So the first thing he says is every good gift and perfect gift is from above. See, from our fallen nature and from those, those things in the world that would entice us, we expect nothing good, no true goodness. But every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord, comes from our heavenly Father. And of course, the ultimate goodness of any gift must be measured with the scale of eternity, the eternal scale. Because something may seem good, like winning the lottery may seem good, but ultimately it could lead to our destruction. We've all read those stories of someone winning the lottery, then all of a sudden, they're two, two weeks later, a month later, they're down in the hole. They're bankrupt. They, they're worse off than they were before. And so James, in these verses here, wants us to understand the nature of God. He says, with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. 
See, God's goodness is constant. There is no variation of no shadow. Instead of shadow, God is the father of lights. And in, in the ancient Greek grammar, James actually says the father of the lights. The, the specific lights are the celestial bodies that light up the sky both day and night, the sun, the moon, and the stars, that even when we don't see them, they're still there, right? When it's dark here in St. Kitts, somewhere else in the world, it's light. Because even so, there is never a shadow with God. And so the Lord cares for us even or especially when the trials come in our lives. God is the giver of every good thing in our lives. And so even these trials that he gives us is a good thing because he's maturing us, he's growing us, he wants us to endure through those things. And he's the unchanging source of, of every good that we've ever had, ever, that we have now, and that we'll ever have or experience in the future. And so... It's important for us to understand that God never changes. He never changes. His, his, and this means that his love for me and his love for you is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Because so many people think that, oh man, I messed up. God's, gonna, God's not going to love me anymore. Or God loves me less because of my sin. And it draws us down this deep hole. And we go, draw further and what, further away from God, thinking that he's going further and further away. But really, he's staying here, and we're going further and further away. Psalms 103, 13 and 14 gives us a, a little bit of more of the nature of God. He says, he is like a father to us, tender and sympathetic. He knows what we're made of. He knows that we are dust. See, God made us. He knows that we're just made of mere molecules, right? He knows that we're frail creatures. He knows that we're going to fall into temptation. And so he gave us Jesus for forgiveness. And praise God for that. God wants to be the father that many of us may have never had. He is tender and sympathetic toward us. He says this in Jeremiah 31, 3. He says, I love you with a love that lasts forever. I keep on loving you with faithful love. And so he cares for us and he loves us when we're doing good and when we're doing bad, when we're angry. He loves us even when we're breaking his heart. And why? And, you know, some of us might be thinking, well, why in the world would God still love me? My life is so messed up. How in the world can he do that? Well, it's because his love is unconditional. It's not based on my performance. It's not based on what I do. It's based on him, his character, his nature. It's unchanging. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is found in Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 8. This is how much God cares and loves us. He said, God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we are still sinners, while we're still being dumb, being stupid, doing things that are, are making bad decisions, it says Christ died for us. That's how much he loves us. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this, to lay one's life for one's friend. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. He went to the cross so that we can have forgiveness of sin, so we can have a relationship with him, so he can, uh, we can be made into his righteousness, that we can endure through trials through him. And even when we fall in temptation, we can say, God, help me, forgive me. And he says, all right, brother, get back up. Don't stay down there. Get back up and keep going. And so James says that there is no variation, no shadow of turning with God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. His love for us never changes. And then he speaks about our salvation. He says, of his own will, he brought forth by the word of truth that we, me and you, might be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. So James here is speaking about the salvation. And we can see the goodness of God in our salvation, Right? That though we are sinners, Christ died for us. As he initiated our salvation, what? By his own will and brought us forth to spiritual life by what? His word of truth that we might be to the glory of the first fruits of his harvest. That is an amazing thing to think about. And, G and James, James is speaking to his own generation, right? The beginning of James chapter 1, he says, to uh, the, the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So he is essentially speaking to the Jewish Christians because the Gentiles haven't really brought in, bought into the fold. But some have speculated on this even more, saying that James had in mind a wider redemption among the unknown creatures of God, which were uh, we, you and I, are the first 
fruits of a wider redemption. And we know that to be true because then here comes along Paul and Paul is the speaking to the Gentiles and brings the Gentiles into the fold. And so there is this wider redemption for everybody. And if you're not a Jew, then you're a Gentile. That's what a Gentile is. It's, it's anybody that's not a Jew. So if you're not Jewish in this room, you're a Gentile. And so it's a wonderful thing to think about these things. It's an even greater thing to believe it, to believe God. That when God does a work, he often sends something like a first fruits in our life. Listen, we, when we see God working, when we see him helping us to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, let us pray that it's a kind of a first fruit in what God is doing in our life. That as we endure that God is maturing us so the next time we endure and so we don't fall into temptation. We don't allow that trial to turn into temptation. And so as God produces endurance to not fall into temptation through our various trials, we can thank him that he's tender and sympathetic to us, that he allows us to go through those things and he sees us through them. Even when we fall, he said, all right, get back up, brother. You can, let's, I'll be with you. You're forgiven. Let me just say, if God has done some great things in your life, then thank the Lord for it. Praise God that he's done those things. Let me tell you that every good and perfect gift comes from our heavenly Father. So take joy in it. Take peace in it. It's a wonderful thing just to realize that God sends forth his good and perfect gifts and that we can be fully satisfied in him that we don't need the desires of this world because he wants to satisfy those desires in the way that he, only he can, in a way that's going to bring joy into our lives. So enjoy those things, but realize it and pray for it, that every good that he does in your life, especially spiritually right now, that it's kind of a, a first fruit, that it will continue on as, as you desire after him and not of the things of this world. And so, as we close our time together, we've seen in these verses the nature of temptation. And we've seen the nature of a good and perfect God, that he's unchanging. And may that good and perfect God en enable us to understand, to prepare, and to grow through the difficulties of temptation. That we may be able to mature even in those things that we don't give in to our desires to sin, and that, that we don't allow it to turn into sin itself. And it won't allow, us, allow it to separate us from God as the enemy desires to do in our lives. And so what I want to do is do one more thing. And, and if this is you, if you've found yourself and you've fallen into temptation and you feel that separation from God, then I want to give you an opportunity to bring that to the Lord. I want to give us an opportunity to re repent of those things. Because maybe there's something in your life you're just like, oh man, I blew it. And, the, and the, the devil's trying to condemn you, saying, oh yeah, you blew it. See, what the enemy does, is what, before we sin, he minimizes it. But then after we sin, he tries to maximize it, tries to condemn us. But the Lord says there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So I want to give us an opportunity to come to the Lord and repent. Because the scripture says when we repent, when we say, God, forgive me, I sinned against you then the Bible tells us that he forgives us. And, he, and he, this is how he forgives us, instantly. He doesn't wait. He doesn't say, let me, let me make you suffer a little bit longer. Instantly, freely. He does, it's not anything we do, but it's, it's in him. And he does it completely. He completely forgives us. His love is unchanging. That's why he does it. And so if you've fallen into temptation and need re repentance, here's your opportunity. And what I want us to do is I, I'm going to uh, say a prayer, and it's nothing uh, magical about this prayer, but, but if you earnestly believe that God can forgive you through Christ, then I encourage you to repeat this after me. And I, and I, and I encourage everybody in the room to repeat this after me because I don't believe anyone should pray alone. And so just bow your heads and, and, and just repeat after me. Dear God, Thank you for your promise that if I confess, you hear me. I'm sorry for my sins. I want to live the rest of my life the way you want me to.
Help me to set aside all worldly desires to focus and listen just to you. Help me to get to know you better. Help me to better understand your plan and your purpose for my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And so if you earnestly believe in your heart what you just prayed, then know that, that the Lord forgives you, that you're forgiven. And let us, may not, let us leave here and not be tempted by the worldly desires, but live for Christ. Have the desire to live for Christ. And let your love for him be your motivation.